Good afternoon. Recording everybody. in progress. Uh, uh, we will be having a session three on uh, contributions of fisheries in providing food and nutrition security, uh, which uh, this, uh, with the four eminent speakers. Uh, I I will now uh, introduce our uh, chair of this session, uh, Dr. A. G. Pannaya, uh, who has uh, served in uh, ICR institution that is in. Uh, Siba in Chennai as a director. After his retirement, uh, he has uh, moved to World Fish Centre at Penang, Malaysia, and he was the program leader uh, for the Biodiversity and Genetic Resource Research Program in December uh, 2001. And he also served there as a discipline director of the Reorganized Aquaculture and Genetics Program of World Fish Centre there. So he. Uh, he he also served as a network coordinator uh, for uh, genetics in aquaculture and he was elected as a National Academy of Agriculture Sciences uh, Fellow in uh, 2013. Uh, he has uh, specialized in population genetics, uh, database uh, develop, uh, development, germplasm uh, germ conservation, then uh, risk assessment of alien species, uh, dissemination of uh, improved strains in aquaculture. Uh, one of his uh, pioneering work was the uh, gift lapia, uh, which he worked uh, in uh, ICER as well as in World Fish Center, and it is giving good results, and it is one of the uh, important uh, fish is being cultured. Uh, he has published more than 106 uh, peer-reviewed uh, papers. Uh, apart from that, uh, he also uh, contributed uh, 22 book chapters uh, apart from that, uh, he also edited uh, 143 publications for various journals. Uh, with this, uh, I, I hand over this uh, session to the um, chairman, uh, Dr. A.G. Ponya, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be associated with the MSR of Foundation and this virtual uh, consultation on ensuring food and nutrition security in the context of uh, climate change and COVID. All are you aware that uh, very important strides had been made in terms of uh, food and nutrition security, especially with the fisheries and aquaculture. Uh, but COVID had uh, shown us how fragile uh, those advances are uh, because of the interconnected nature of all our activities. Uh, and. Uh, it also uh, clearly indicates that uh, why we need to go into the kind of system concept that we need to discuss and not alone not to the system concept, we have to think of the whole value chain. Uh, if you have to address and uh, both for climate change and for the COVID and post COVID uh, ramifications. So I am sure this consultation would bring out important, consult uh, important uh, recommendations both with a guide, uh, organizations like MSRF and research organizations and the policymakers. Uh, we have a very uh, distinguished panel of uh, speakers with a diverse background, and I'm uh, sure that uh, they will be able to bring out the potential of uh, uh, fish uh, as a health food, because uh, I think that is one story that has not been told adequately enough, and also which is more sustainable if you want to have a, a highly nutritious protein, and which is also in terms of climate change having the least impact, it is only fish. So I, I think it's a golden opportunity that uh, we must utilize uh, to ensure that there is a food and nutrition security. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Veiluli, who, who heads the Fish for All Center in uh, MSRF. And uh, I am uh, happy that uh, Fish for All was one of the uh, programs launched when I was in World Fish Center. And I find here at least there is that legacy is being continued, uh, especially which goes to show how inclusive uh, these programs can be. With a rich background of working in coastal livelihoods, biodiversity conservation, post service management, and climate change and gender mainstreaming, she brings a wide array of skills to this particular job. And her, uh, as you have seen the video that was projected, the mobile app that she has popularized has also shown how IT can be uh, can be made 
uh, sort of inclusive uh, and where it can address the small social, uh, I mean, uh, uh, less privileged people. Uh, and also a work on gender mainstreaming is something which we complemented. Uh, uh, so again, I'm glad that uh, the good work that is done by Fish Fall Center will get its prominence. And I call upon Dr. Ravivili to uh, deliver his speech. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, for each speaker, actually, uh, we can have 12 minutes so that uh, we can have, a, at the end, we have a discussion. So, good afternoon to all. Uh, <coughs> thanks for the introduction, sir. Actually, my topic today uh, is the contribution of uh, small-scale fisheries for addressing the household food security. Uh, what are the issues, challenges, uh, these uh, small-scale fisheries? Uh, people facing and uh, some of the key recommendations. Uh, so in the morning session, we all heard about the importance of fish for uh, human uh, nutrition. So we all agreed that the fish is a crucial food uh, to your nutritious diet across the uh, globe. Uh, it is an excellent uh, uh, health food rich in protein, minerals, uh, and all the vitamins so like A, D, K. So all the lot of vitamins are available in the fish. Then it also accounted for about 70%, 17 percentage of total animal protein and 7 percentage of all the proteins consumed globally. Uh, the products, uh, fish and other fishery products, uh, are recognized not only as some of the healthiest food on the planet, but also some of the least impactful on the uh, natural environment. The current scenario, this is the very important point. And uh, the, so that the fish is uh, vital for uh, national, regional, and global food security and uh, uh, nutrition strategies, and have a big part to play in transforming the food systems and eliminating hunger and malnutrition. Then coming to the small scale fisheries sector, uh, uh, more than 40 million uh, people worldwide are directly involved in uh, small scale uh, fisheries for their livelihood and income. Uh, it is a very dynamic uh, sector, uh, diversified activities. Uh, both uh, men and women are involved in throughout its uh, value chain. It is one of the uniqueness of this small scale fisheries sector. It also responsible for approximately 50% of the global fisheries, uh, captured fisheries landings in la developing countries. And again, the problem here is that the remote and the dispersed nature of small scale fishes it is difficult to fully capture in the official uh, statistics. So the contribution of the small scale fisheries to livelihood, food and nutrition security are largely unknown. This is one of the uh, factor we have to consider when we talk about the food and nutrition security. Then coming to the Indian scenario, in India, more than 81 percentage of the uh, total fishery sector under small scale. And this, the small scale community, small scale fisher community, they have a very good understanding of the resources, fishery resources, which is passed on from one generation to another uh, generation. These people are uh, mostly linked with the local networks. So uh, more women, because of this reason, more women uh, get opportunity to get an empl employment through the small scale fisheries. And uh, they are also dependent on uh, middlemen and uh, for uh, middlemen and those who buy their harvest. And this sector directly and indirectly contribute to the food and nutrition security for all the people, but especially for marine dependent households. And how uh, this uh, small scale fisheries contribute for the household food security. So I already told this, uh, it is an important opportunities, the small scale fisheries uh, is an important opportunity to enhance the household security in developing countries like India. There are uh, due to the variety of activities involved, like the harvesting of fish and associated uh, post-harvesting activities like vending, processing, uh, trading, etc. It generates a lot of livelihoods for the uh, dependents and employment and also income to the millions of people around the world. So this sector proves meaningful contribution to poverty alleviation and food security, particularly for uh, those involved directly with the fishing. Uh, that is the fishers and fish workers, both involved in pre and post harvesting activities and dependence of the, uh, uh, the fishers. 
the, their families and their households and the communities. And also it uh, contributed for the consumers, those who buy the fish for human consumption. And this small scale fisheries provide, uh, I would say the word, the cr critical safety net uh, for vulnerable households when they face a sudden decline in income. It was clearly evidenced uh, the uh, present uh, COVID pandemic. Har all the harbors are stopped, uh, travel restricted, mobility restricted. Even then the small scale fishers, uh, they go for fishing for uh, and uh, catch some fish for household consumptions. So uh, this small scale fisher, fisheries contribute uh, two ways. One is direct uh, pathway and indirect pathway to achieve the household food security. In the direct pathway uh, through consumption, uh, the households, those who are engaged in the small scale fisheries are able to improve their own nutritional intake by consuming some of the fish they capture. So in which uh, this uh, co directly contribute for the household food security. And the indirect pathway through income and the empowerment of the women in the fishery sector. The income pathway, the increased purchasing power through sale of fish is, is recognized as a critical for household to be able to access other foods and also improve their overall dietary intake. In the, in the, I will, uh, in the next slide, I will explain in detail. The third aspect is the distribution pathway, the degree of control exercised by the women uh, over family income impacts directly on household food security and nutritional outcomes. So when we talk about the household food security, these three pathways are very, very important. So this is the overall uh, framework of uh, how these fish, small scale fisheries contribute for the nutrition security of the household. So uh, the, uh, in the, the first pathway, the, actually first uh, we take the income pathway. Uh, the small scale fishers, they have the household assets, either boats or fishing gears, and some of them going for fishing laborers. So they catch some fish uh, and they sell, uh, sell the fish and it in increase the household income. So because of the increase the income, their purchasing power somewhat increased. And uh, because of that, they take some uh, sufficient uh, intake of staple foods. It, uh, it improves the household food security. At the same time, the, uh, it also contributes for the dietary intake. Uh, the fish, some amount of fish goes for household consumption. So it gives the protein rich food for the uh, households uh, and also vitamins, uh, uh, etc. So the dietary in, uh, intake of the household ensure. And uh, the women, those who are involved in the, the uh, for example, in the small scale fishery sector, the women role is very, very important. They are uh, dominantly involved in marketing, uh, trading, I would say, uh, vending, fish vending, uh, post harvesting activities. So they access to local markets and also some of them going for urban markets. And some of them are involved in post harvest technologies like processing, uh, drying, etc. So this, the women participation uh, enhanced in the uh, uh, pathway, then it, because of that, they have earned some income, it empowering the women in the decision making process and the income and the empowerment uh, leads to the, uh, uh, spend some, uh, some, some amount for uh, food and health care for children. Because of that, the improving care for children and women health, it overall impact on the improved health status of the family. So the diet intake, then improve health status uh, leads to the nutritional uh, address the nutritional security of the household it reducing the risk of undernutrition and micronutrient deficiency this is the uh, framework and but each uh, uh, pathway we have a lot of issues uh, 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 issues we have discussed here uh, the consumption pathway is uh, uh, is helpful for uh, direct contribution of the household food security, but at the same time, it has its own limitations. Uh, especially the many poor households engaged in full-time small-scale fishing activities, such contributions are very, very crucial at the household, uh, individual level, at the, and, and also at the household uh, food security. Uh, why I'm telling this point here is that the percentage of total household catch that is consumed by the households are greatly varied. It depends on both the level of commercialization in the fishery and also the level of poverty in the household. So uh, mostly what we assumed that the poor consume a greater, greater proportion of their catch, but in the reality, 
they consume a lower proportion of their catch than better off households uh, instead they sell most of their fish in order to purchase other food, food items to uh, to manage their families the direct contribution of fish to food security for the poorest households may therefore be lower than generally we thought so preventing these household from accessing the nutritional benefit that fish offers so this is the reality uh, in the diagram actually uh, this is the diagram drawn by one of the fishermen uh, uh, the it, it, it clearly spell about the the food household food security uh, at the uh, small scale fisher family so it is the 1950 they catch more fish and whatever fish they catch first it goes to the plate of the family then remaining uh, fish go, go for uh, sales but in the case, but now uh, in the 2000 uh, scenario uh, the catch is also very, the catch is drastically reduced and uh, whatever catch they uh, uh, whatever catch they get uh, it goes for uh, sales uh, to meet out the family uh, expenses so they the the, the fisherman family eating fish also drastically reduced well, in terms of income part, uh, indirect contribution for uh, food security through household income it is through increasing power, uh, purchasing power through sales of fish uh, it is uh, crucial for poor fishers access other food and if they get good fish catch the cash generated by selling fish can also be reinvested in fishing asset which in turn improve the household welfare and food intake the market dynamism also impact the household food security decrease in price has some potential positive impact on the food they intake of the small scale fishers but here the again issue here is that the small scale fishers are facing lot of challenges the fisheries are threatened by overfishing pollution then because of that the coastal fisheries uh, resources are reduced and again the climate change also contribute on this overall impacted the uh, uh, the food security and well, the mssr of the fish for all center in ubar we are uh, addressing some of the issues through our intervention um, uh, our learning here is that the sustainability of the fisheries is a fundamental condition for food security and uh, nutrition so for that purpose to improve the to increase the sustainability of the uh, uh, improve the sustainability of the fisheries we do some activities with the involvement of the small scale fishers like uh, artificial reefs uh, to increase the near shore uh, fish resources uh, which uh, in turn affect the income of the small scale fishers and the voluntary code of practice for uh, conserving the majority of the fish resources and also the co management practice committees uh, for participatory resource management involving the small scale uh, uh, fishing communities then the third is the third one is the the distribution pathway the women participation in small scale uh, coastal fisheries uh, in in fisheries the division of labor is very clear uh, the women participation in fishery value chains uh, lead to their empowerment uh, so uh, uh, greater control over income resulting in uh, increased spending on food and health care for children and thus improved nutrition outcomes so overall it uh, impacts the Uh, health status of the family here again issue is that the poor infrastructure in the landing center then uh, reduction in the fish catch and nowadays all the the trading and all the fish uh, catch and all harbor focused fish trading uh, leads to the marginalization of the women in fisheries and also the lack of transportation facilities so this also some of the key issues uh, it affects the food security then possible intervention here is that or to facility uh, facility to create hygienically processing fishes storage units the solar drying yards these are some of the important interventions to uh, to involve the uh, women participation and also increase the income of the uh, women headed households then coming to the final uh, 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 my point, final point uh, is that actually the fisheries policy and food policies have been uh, largely isolated from each other uh, uh, fisheries policies often aim, aim to optimize the uh, economic benefits of the uh, economic benefits and conservation of the fish resources but food policies uh, tend to focus almost um, uh, ex uh, exclusively to the terrestrial systems 
so what uh, what we suggest that the what is the message uh, uh, and what is the recommendation for the uh, to address it, to address some of the issues here is that make fish as a visible integral element in food security and nutrition strategy programs uh, this is so, which is an important thing and we have to think about it then recognize the specific contribution of the small scale fisheries to food and nutrition securities we generally talk about the fisheries but uh, we are not talking about the small scale fishermen alone so when we talk about the fisheries we it inclusion of the small scale fisheries also then recognize the sustainability of fisheries is a fundamental condition for food and nutrition uh, security and integrate food security and nutrition concerns into fisheries and aquaculture related policy and programs and finally take into account the requirements of small scale fisheries uh, uh, the, especially the fishermen and women in the uh, sector in design and implementation of national and international policies and programs related to fisheries even including the investment plans as appropriate so with this note i conclude my uh, speech uh, thank you Thank you, Dr. Velvali, for a very brief but uh, very succinct uh, uh, message of the need for uh, integrating uh, fisheries into the overall food security system. And especially uh, struck by your uh, thing saying that uh, fishers sometimes do not have the nutritious, the fish that they, they themselves catch because they have to divert it for other things, which is a reality that uh, many of us do not realize. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go for the next uh, speaker. Dr. Rohana Sivar Singh, uh, I think uh, many of you uh, who are in the fisheries would be aware of uh, Dr. Rohana Sivar Singh because of his, uh, uh, he was with FAO for quite a long time and during this period, he had done quite a good con uh, contribution to aquaculture and uh, during his program, uh, the aquatic animal health also received a great uh, impetus. Uh, he also was uh, uh, active in many of the international forums and uh, uh, his contribution for uh, projecting the developing world is something which I recollect when I was in the World Fish Center. I'm, I'm glad that he's still active. Uh, now I, I understand he's in, uh, working in uh, Nigeria and he has got wide-ranging interest uh, and it'll be a pleasure to uh, hear from him. Over to Dr. Rogana Singh. Thank you very much, Dr. Panaya. I think I have a small technical issue with my video. For some reason, I cannot connect, but I think I, you can hear me. Yes. Right. I'll try to share my screen. In the event I cannot share, <clears throat> I will just talk the 12 minutes without okay. uh, any screen. But let me try to share the screen. <clears throat> can you see the screen? No, we are only. Ah, uh, yes, you can see it. You can see the screen. Good. Yeah, right. you can see. So you don't. You won't see my face. Never mind. You can hear me well, right? And uh, so I will use the screen to for the next twelve minutes. Thank you very much for the um, Swami Nathan Foundation for asking me to um, sort of take a few minutes of my time and to tell you about the fish in the world. What I'm trying to say for the next ten minutes is to give you a sort of a glitch of a, the status of fish in people's lives globally. I will also um, talk a little bit focused with Africa because Africa is a very interesting and very important continent in the world. I'll tell you why. And then I will also try to give you a prospects for the future, how much fish we will be requiring and for why. And then also take you with few main challenges that we will face in, in bridging the supply demand gap for fish in the future. Right, and hopefully this should work. Global population of course is increasing, we all know that. So to make sure everybody get a three meals a day or at least the majority, we will have to increase the production of food by at least 60% over the next 20, 30 years. So 60% increase of food from what is it now without having any more resources than what we have now is a challenge. So this challenge 
is now considered as a challenge where you have to completely rethink and completely redesign food production, taking into account what we call a systems approach. Systems approach is the approach that we take, not just looking at compartmentalized food production, the, whether it is fish or whether it is rice or whether it is vegetables or something, but we're talking about the entire value chain, how important the value chain objective and perspective in production as a system while considering the inputs and all the services required and the outputs and the consumers all in one. So this food systems approach is a new approach that we are working towards um, sort of bringing all the sustainable development goals and these sustainable development goals, uh, there are specific ones from this list you can see that where fish can contribute, particularly as an aquatic food. Why fish? There are three main reasons for fish. We already heard from Dr. Velvishi about a little bit of uh, why fish. Fish is important for food security, that's why you're talking about. Fish is important for livelihoods and employment and fish is important for nutrition. Over 1 billion people in the world um, obtain most of the animal protein from fish. And I myself as a Sri Lankan, and you are mainly from our bigger continent, India. And in Sri Lanka, we probably take uh, more than 50% of, of our protein, animal protein from fish. When you go to uh, a landlocked country in Africa, they probably take very little, maybe maybe 2%, um, 3% or even less. So there's a huge disparity between the geographies of the world uh, of how much fish is used for food security. Over 800 million people depend on fisheries and aquaculture. We heard how much is big is in India. And this is, a, this, is this level of involvement in the food production sector is extremely important for us to uh, consider we, when we talk about the future of fish, food. I'm not going to go into details of how important fish is for nutrition because fish provides uh, um, a nutritious, fish is nutritious and it provides nutrition, provides various um, fat, fatty acids, um, various uh, micronutrients, vitamins, everything. Some of them are which cannot be replaced by anything else. The fish for nutrition has its own place. You probably already heard from the global laureate of the food price laureate this morning and how important fish is for nutrition. So fish is important for nutrition. Fish makes up a, a um, uh, more than, you know, sort of a, a lot of people and fish consumption shares, uh, Africa is the lowest in fish consumption. Um, right. The, Current fish production in 2018, we produced 96.4 million tons of fish. And 2018, from aquaculture, we produced 82 million tons. And so altogether, total production of fish in 2018 was 179 million tons. The Asia, of course, including India, produced 90%. The rest of the 10% comes from the rest of the world. This is a very, very famous, um, uh, graph that you can see how the four sectors, capture fisheries inland, capture fisheries marine, aquaculture inland and aquaculture marine sort of uh, uh, contributes to fish. You can see the capture fisheries or aquaculture marine and aquaculture uh, freshwater are increasing and that is compensating the requirement for a supply for the demands. Global per capita animal consumption is uh, um, about 20.5 kilograms and uh, Africa per capita consumption is less than 10 kilograms per person per year, which is extremely low, more than 50% for a large continent with where the uh, population is increasing. Therefore, we should be focusing. When you look at globally, how important the fish consumption and the fish production increases in Africa. Fish supply, total food fish, as I said, 179 million tons in 2018. And we believe it will require 
additional 26 million tons or 15 percent increase by from 2018 to 2030 so 200 and to make it to 204 million tons we require 26 million tons more fish to be produced between 2020 and 2030 over the next 10 years that 15 percent is of course a much less than the previous increases that we have seen because we believe aquaculture in increasing growth of aquaculture will be reduced over the coming decade and it will not as increase as it used to be uh, with a very high uh, rate of increase you can see from this graph the again the yellow area is the capture fisheries and the, uh, and the, the blue area is the aquaculture so oh, everything that we need required future 25 million tons of additional fish has to come from aquaculture. Therefore, aquaculture is extremely important. So in 2018, as I said, 82 million tons. And in 2030, we require additional 26 million tons. And as I said, the, the, um, the growth of aquaculture, a predicted growth is much less than it used to be in the previous, 10 decade, uh, previous decade. Consumption, even after increasing 26 million tons, by 2030, we believe the, the maximum consumption will increase by about a kilo. So currently 20.3, 20.5, it probably will be 21.5 by 2030. It will be increased globally, but in Africa, we believe it will even decrease a little bit over the next 10 years, it will not increase, simply because the population in Africa is increasing very rapidly and, and then the per capita consumption will go down. There are several challenges. The, the challenges are the feed, how to feed the increased requirement for increased production, what seed to be used for better production, how can we biosecure, how can we use the technology, what technological improvements are required, how can we make aquaculture carbon zero? Because the carbon emission is extremely high and we are all experiencing serious climate change issues. What is the consumer demand? How can we produce for the consumers? And how can we ensure that the aquaculture sector becomes more inclusive, that everyone has a benefit? From this, you can see, I'm just showing you the fish meal production. The fish meal production is not increasing and but fish production is increasing you need to feed fish means that you need to feed make more feed more feed means more fish meal those days but right now we have taken a lot of research and the research has improved us to even to have fish feed without any fish meal in the feed so zero fish meal feeds are possible and we are using other sources of protein and the, the lot of breakthroughs, and we believe fish meal will not be an issue for uh, increased fish feed production in the future. This is another nice graph to showing that what areas of research is going into supplementing fish meal and supplementing fish, animal protein in the fish diets, in the fish feeds. So we are into various um, like krill, me krill meals and plant oils and plant dry matter and various things. So since 1990 to 2030, we believe the newest products like uh, algae and krill will sort of start to replace more and more animal proteins in fish feeds. <clears throat> Impact of rising feed ingredient prices is a, another main issue. Everything, the prices are rising. When the ingredient price rises, your feed price rises. So that will affect the smallholders being able to use formulated feed in their aquaculture. Seed is important. I do not have to say anything more about genetics because Dr. Ponaya is one of the experts in the world. So how important good quality seed? How can we get good quality seed? What's the contribution of genetics to the good quality feed seed? Without good quality seed, we will not be able to bridge the supply demand gap by 2030. So therefore we should be focusing on good genetics research and good quality seed for aquaculture. Biosecurity, we all experience diseases, health issues, outbreaks, 
and we really need to have a very strong biosecurity in our systems, both smallholders and medium and the corporate aquaculture. Technology, I'm not going to talk about the RAS systems and how the, how the other technology, but I'm taking a one something completely different for this discussion. We are talking about now what we call synthetic fish. Fish without fish. There's a lot of research going on to produce fish and shrimp products without fish or shrimp. They are completely laboratory based. There is a company called Finless Foods where they produce fish with no fish. So, they, so in other words, we are talking about no animals are raised, no carbon is em emitted, but we still have a meat product like fish. And very early stages of research, products are extremely expensive to afford, but we believe over the next 20 years, finless fish or fish or shrimp without fish or shrimp will become a reality. Zero carbon aquaculture is extremely important. The aquaculture doesn't emit too much carbon compared to livestock, but aquaculture is still emits some carbon. As we all try to reduce the carbon emission globally in food production, we need to look at zero carbon by particularly reducing animal feed in the fish feeds and also maximizing and optimizing the, um, the productivity of the ponds and the production systems so that we can reduce the carbon uh, footprint. Um, of course, the, the, the um, consumer demand is something extremely important. What the consumers need? We cannot dictate terms with the consumers. The consumers will demand, we need this. What the consumers are now, this work from MSC shows that consumers are extremely um, sort sir, of one more interested minute, huh? in look. Dr. What, Arana, sir. Uh, yes. Just a minute more. Sure. Um, sustainability of information for seafood products, uh, stores, and on packaging. So they're very, very interested in seeing where these are produced and how these are produced and what is in the, uh, the packaging to understand the, the, uh, the uh, origin of the products. Inclusive growth, as I mentioned, we must make sure that aquaculture is um, benefiting everyone all along the, the value chain, not um, only one sector, not only the processor, not only the producer, the everyone, suppliers, everyone who is giving uh, inputs and services. So therefore, inclusive growth is an extremely important. So with all that, we are, don't forget about the small fish. Small fish are the most important and most uh, uh, nutritious products. This particular picture coming from Odisha and the eating fish with the heads and eyes and fins and everything. And with a whole fish will give you more nutrition for poor and for unaffordable and will make it healthier for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Verna, for a, a very good presentation, uh, which also brings uh, one critical factor is that uh, uh, fish consumption is not going to increase that drastically un until unless we intervene. So that's a thought that uh, we should all take it because uh, being in the fishery sector, and uh, especially in India, you see that uh, fish consumption uh, is not increasing according to the potential. And uh, I think uh, that is something that, uh, again, we'll uh, talk about. We go to the uh, next speaker, uh, who is uh, Dr. Imelda. Uh, I think uh, one of the key uh, things that uh, Imelda and her group of scientists have done is uh, popularizing cage culture. Uh, now, cage culture is being talked about as a viable proportion for uh, livelihood among fishermen also and among uh, uh, coastal people. Uh, so, 
that is something I think uh, we must uh, credit uh, Imelda and the team of scientists. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hear her speech. Dr. Imelda. Good afternoon, uh, respected chair and to the organizers. I hope I am audible, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Yeah, today I am uh, giving a brief uh, lecture on innovation in aquaculture and imperative in nutritional security. Here I am uh, looking more into the uh, perspective from Indian uh, perspective and uh, not global. Uh, then nutritional security refers to access uh, to uh, access to adequate utilization of nutrients in food to be able to live because uh, these all these definitions I may not go into that because uh, how much it is uh, fish is contributing to the nutritional security we have to see even though we have food security we may have tubers we may have grains we may have pulses but what is contributed by fish cannot be replaced by other food items. That's why I have mentioned that. Uh, fish is crucial to nutritious diet in many areas across the world. And uh, in India also, a few pockets or few states only are uh, consuming fish to considerable level. And uh, majority of the people are vegetarians here. So we have to highlight it as a health food rather than a non-veg uh, food. Uh, when it comes to the... Uh, uh, nutritional... Uh, the most important contribution of uh, fish is the omega-3 fatty acids. My excuse to speakers uh, and uh, previous uh, speakers also have mentioned about the omega-3 fatty acids and the uh, micronutrients which is contributing uh, to the uh, consumers. Uh, it has a lot of health benefits which I have uh, mentioned here and it contains vitamins and uh, uh, minerals also and all these have very good uh, role in the human uh, immune systems and health uh, because I have few more, more slides that's why I'm uh, just skipping all this. Uh, then global scenario of fisheries and aquaculture also has been mentioned by the previous speaker and we have seen that there are a global uh, capture fisheries production from 1990 to 2018 has been increased to 14% and the global aquaculture production has been increased to plus 527%. And the total food consumption has been increased to plus 122%. It is definitely because of the um, uh, nutritional benefit of a fish. When it comes to the fishery scenario in India, uh, we have got, uh, especially in the marine sector, we have got 8.18 kilometers of con uh, coastline. And we have got uh, so much of uh, resources to go for uh, mariculture. Uh, but uh, still it is in the infant stage. And the fisheries contributes to about 1.4% of the national uh, uh, GDP. And uh, agriculture GDP is contributing to about 7.28%. Uh, and uh, the uh, states which are uh, high in uh, fish consumption are Tripura, Kerala, Manipur, Odisha, and Assam. And uh, it is very striking to see that only 2.266 kg per capita consumption of fish in India. Uh, it is not because the fish is not available or uh, we have got so much of uh, catch marine except for 3.72 million tons and the inland is about 10.43 million tons, uh, million metric tons. So still, uh, the consumption in the country is only 0.266 kg per capita. It is because the uh, majority of the people are uh, still uh, shying away from eating fish. So this we have to promote among the people to have more uh, nutritional security in the country. Uh, then uh, food, when it comes to the food security and aquaculture, uh, uh, feeding an expected global population of uh, 9 billion by 2050 is a challenge for researchers, technical experts, leaders and world over. And it's a promising fact that fish can play a major role in satisfying the palates of the world's growing population by meeting the food security. Then aquaculture is the, because uh, capture fisheries beyond a limit we cannot increase and we have to uh, focus mainly on aquaculture 
and uh, about 6% annual growth it has over the decade. And uh, so uh, it, it can be uh, made available uh, and accessible to consumers around the world. And we are, uh, then aquaculture only can fill the gap between rising demands for fishery products and the uh, capture fisheries production. And it can make a significant contribution to food and nutrition security. Then uh, the sector will continue to expand further because uh, our resources are being underutilized in the country. Then we can domesticate more species and we can go for biotechnological innovations uh, for uh, to improving the stock performance, etc. Then what uh, well we was also telling that 80 to 100 percent of the aquaculture products from the rural farm households are marketed because uh, they need money because it's a livelihood and uh, it suggests that uh, it is a cash generating activity and uh, thus an important indirect source of food security because uh, they can get even if they consume a portion of it they get the nutrition and the rest they can sell for getting the other uh, uh, other items like uh, grains and pulses etc thus in addition to the nutritional advantages of increased fish production aquaculture would bring the diversification necessary to provide a source of livelihood and foreign exchange essential for this can bring development to the country also then uh, as per statistics uh, fish provided about 3.3 billion people with almost 20 percent of their average per capita intake of animal protein in 1961 to 2017 then average annual growth rate of total food fish consumption increased at 3.1 percent then uh, outpacing the annual population growth rate population growth rate is only 1.6 percent so in per capita terms food consumption on globally has turned from 9 kg to 20.5 kg that already my previous speaker has told uh, the previous speaker has told about all this mm, then uh, aquaculture only has expanded the fish available to regions and countries with otherwise limited or no access to the cultured species uh, it is often a uh, cheaper than other uh, like mutton and beef and all that so yeah, yeah leading to improved nutrition and food security then uh, you can see that in the global level since 2016, aquaculture has been the main source of fish available for human consumption. Uh, it was 52% uh, in 2018. Um, and that uh, figure can be expected to continue to increase in the uh, coming years also. What is driving this increase in supply and consumption of fish world over? Because uh, increased production due to aquaculture and availability also is there. Then technological developments are there. Then rising income worldwide. People have money. Purchasing power has in increased. Then reduction in loss and waste. We have found value additions and uh, um, uh, post-harvest technologies in a more efficient way. Then increased awareness among the people and the health benefits of the people. Then I'll come to this uh, area where uh, we have got a lot of potential in the country. Um, agriculture, uh, it can contribute to food security, nutrition and economic growth in India. Uh, we, as I have told uh, that with that 8118 kilometers of coastal, um, uh, our continent, our uh, coastal area, uh, coastal line, and uh, then the continental shelf area of 0.53 million hectares, uh, then the potential uh, is very high here. We have got brackish water areas also, about 1.4 uh, lakh hectare area uh, in the country. Then, uh, mariculture technologies uh, is very much in line with the uh, spirit of sustainable economic program that's the blue economy of india also india has got the technology now we have got technology for muscle farming pearl culture edible oyster then marine shrimp and crab culture breeding and seed production of sea cucumbers then breeding and seed production of different uh, high value marine fin fishes then ornamental fin fish uh, breeding and seed production then the technology for cage farming in the open sea as well as in the coastal waters then integrated multi-tropic aquaculture in a very sustainable way of farming then aras and bioflop farming systems are also available then uh, food fish uh, we have uh, technology for hatchery and seed production then for breeding and seed production of marine ornamentals uh, this because uh, for livelihood as well as for uh, uh, export orientation or export purpose also this is very good uh, then uh, breeding and seed production of shrimp crab and lobster especially this uh, marine uh, shrimp and uh, marine crabs uh, we are doing it for stock enhancement that is uh, natural uh, uh, stock will be enhanced by sea ranching and uh, then uh, breeding and seed production farming of uh, green mussel uh, remote setting because areas where uh, farming is done seed production may not be possible so seed production can be done at one particular point and it can be transported to the area where uh, farming can be done so then uh, there are different uh, diverse farming systems which we can operate because if you go only for one type of farming there will be environmental degradation a lot of negative impact will be there in the system 
uh, we can go for seekage farming, cage farming in coastal waters, coastal pond farming, integrated intra, then RAS, and these other things. Then diverse species available for farming, because for most of the species, seed production technology has developed by ICR research institutes, uh, including famous RAC bar and all. So all these uh, we can go for farming. Then seaweed, because in India we are not consuming seaweed uh, and it is being used for other, uh, other compounds from that. So the major uh, farm to species is Capaficus alvarezi. Uh, and uh, then in integrated uh, multitrophic aquaculture, that uh, intra we are promoting because it, uh, it can be uh, more economical because uh, uh, diverse species are farmed and uh, there will be more income from that and more products will be there, less risk will be there, and uh, it will. Uh, it is a solution for environmental sus uh, sustainability, that is a biomitigation. We need not have to go for any uh, external uh, uh, involvement or intervention in uh, clearing the system. Then there will be product diversification and the risk reduction also will be there. Then because uh, many uh, two, three items are there, uh, where societal acceptability is also there. Then uh, green muscle can be integrated with the cage farming, then seaweed can be integrated with the cage farming. And uh, we have seen that uh, it, uh, carbon sequestration also is uh, quite high uh, when uh, seaweed is integrated with uh, Madam, cage farming. one more minute. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll just finish up. Then RAS is one, uh, RAS for breeding, uh, spear rearing farming, because um, uh, that uh, cost and salinization will not be much uh, if we go for uh, uh, this type of uh, controlled farming systems. And uh, because it's in a controlled system, disease and other factors also can be. I effectively managed. What are the impacts of mariculture? Uh, because in a society for development, what we need is empowerment of women. Because women are the um, uh, basic structure of a family who nurture their children for nutrition as well as for income and funding of a family. Their empowerment is essential. This is an example. Then empowerment of fishermen and youth. Because everybody cannot be given employment in the government sector. So unemployed and uh, le less educated people or uh, more, they can be empowered by forming uh, groups and uh, self-help groups and all that. Then formation of village-based self-help groups. So this will help in a uh, lot of activities uh, together and it will uh, bring more development in a very short period. So different. Then uh, I'll uh, talk about uh, this is the aquaculture target for 2025 for India by the government of India. Uh, production uh, target is 22 million metric tons. Then aquaculture, 15.5 uh, million metric tons. Export of uh, about US dollar 14 billion. How we can achieve this? Uh, because uh, through the species diversification, farming of high value species, then expanding brackish water aquaculture and mariculture, then farming of non food species like ornamental seaweeds, pearls, and microalgae. So then research targets for food security through mariculture. Uh, we have to innovate more, bring more uh, species and systems of farming and then alternative feed, like uh, Sarah has told uh, about uh, alternative feeds, uh, like uh, now they are using the larvae of the black algae fly, then fermented feeds can be, ingredients can be used, then genetic improvement should be focused, then uh, feed quality, cost and alternate ingredients should be focused on, then climate resilient technologies, because uh, now we can see that there are a lot of cyclones and rain and all that, all that we have to uh, tackle in by having more uh, climate resilient technologies. Then uh, we have to bring more mechanization, automation, and uh, artificial intelligence to the uh, farming systems. Then outreach and adoption. We are keeping on the institutes or research organizations that are developing many technologies, and it has to be disseminated in a very effective way. And we have found that the partnership, public private partnership modes, are the best method for uh, outreach activities and uh, easy adoption of the technologies. Then facilitations for entrepreneurship and business development. That is also being facilitated by the government. Then production and supply chain improvement. That is also in the cards. Then preparation of unprecedented challenges. Because uh, now we are facing COVID like pandemic and there are climatic challenges also. And so for this also, we have to arrive at uh, uh, different uh, things. If we can achieve the targets, definitely agriculture can sustainable. Uh, sustainably contribute to income, employment, food security, and nutrition security of India. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Imelda, for the overview and details about uh, mariculture. Uh, so that's why we we'll go to the last speaker, Dr. Nikita. Uh, as a social, uh, as an economist, she has extensively worked on assessment of fisheries cooperatives. Socioeconomic studies among fishery communities, 
but uh, what she stands for more than anything else is the work on uh, gender mainstreaming, not alone in India, but also the work she has done in other countries. Uh, and uh, she has made a name for herself uh, in, in these kind of books, and we hope to hear from her uh, in detail now. Dr. Nikita. Thank you, sir, for the kind introduction. At the outset, I would like to express my thanks to the Foundation for the kind invitation. It's, uh, I'm deeply honored uh, for the same. Uh, I've been uh, asked to speak on uh, the intersection between gender and nutrition, and I will try to, uh, try to say something about how fish can be integrated into our uh, uh, food uh, and nutrition security policies and programs. In the preparation of this talk, I was I have been I have drawn from some of the work that we've done. I have discussed with my colleagues in the nutrition division and also taken information from some of the published work that's already available. So I start in the beginning. Ma'am, I think you mute. Please unmute. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, Thank you. I'll start uh, at the beginning of what this focus of the session is, that is on nutrition, because as we know, hunger still continues to be one of the major challenges that humanity is facing. And this has been more so, uh, more evident during the pandemic that we saw and that we're still living with, where uh, governments were trying to have quick responses to meet the food requirements of people as well as meet the health uh, uh, requirements. And that is where I think the narrative of food and nutrition security that has shifted from mere availability of food uh, to more important aspects like malnutrition, uh, hidden hunger, and uh, the other extreme of nutrition leading to obesity and other factors have uh, taken center stage. Uh, nutrition is, uh, though, Part of SDG 2, the focus of SDG 2, it is essential for success of several other SDGs, whether it is women empowerment or whether it is uh, climate change and uh, food production or uh, war and conflict and several other SDGs that we are aiming to achieve. So unless we have, uh, we have achieved the nutritional uh, security, several other SDGs may be difficult to achieve too. Uh, this the global nutrition report has is now talking of nutrition equity where everyone deserves access to healthy affordable food and quality nutrition care that is because one in every nine people uh, in the world are still hungry today where on the other end of the spectrum we find that one in every three people are overweight or obese and though we have global and national patterns showing improvements in of food and nutritional security, we know that there are a lot of in, in inequalities within communities and within countries with the vulnerable groups which are more affected. They're, they're women and children, they're migrant labor, they're the informal sector workers, they're people caught in conflict situations which are more vulnerable and uh, which uh, they're the people who actually lack uh, food and nutritional security. And uh, um, Poor diets and the resulting malnutrition is not simply a matter of personal choice. It is, as we all know, the lack of access or affordability to, uh, to healthy diets and uh, quality nutrition. If you look at some of the figures that are uh, there globally, uh, this is an assessment of 194 countries, and we see that even on uh, indicators like anemia and low birth weight, which we have been talking of for several decades, uh, we are not progressing at all, or in fact, several countries are worsening. And uh, the other nutrition-related uh, targets like obesity and diabetes, in fact, we are a country, several, majority of countries are off target on these issues. And uh, indication is that the number of undernourished people have been actually steadily increasing right from 2014 onwards. Some of the other indicators, if you see like child and adolescent nutrition uh, for, in particular, if you see almost 30% of girls and boys are underweight. This is actually the future of nations, different nations. And so this is really alarming, uh, a situation that is alarming. And now if you look at it from the gender point of view, we know that uh, gender inequalities are sort of normalized socioculturally, and we know that women have unequal access or sometimes even no access or control of resources. We saw 
uh, will really talk of small scale fisheries. Similarly, in, in, agri in agriculture, we have women play major roles in food production itself. Uh, though women are found in post harvest in uh, fisheries, they also, what is hidden is that they're also found in harvesting fish in small scale fisheries. They, uh, they actually harvest red fish from uh, near shore waters. They use small um, um, indigenous gear to harvest fish from waters that are close by their homestead. So there is a lot of production that goes hidden from the, uh, um, you know, recorded production figures in fisheries especially and which, which is actually contributed by the women. But they may not have a say over that the income that comes from them. And ultimately, uh, they are the ones, uh, fundamentally, uh, the provision of food and nutrition to the families falls on their shoulders. And when they can't dec take decisions on what food to purchase and how this food should be served to the uh, people in the household, uh, it becomes a situation is really very uh, critical. And uh, this actually leads to chronic hunger. There is uh, underweight, there is stunting, there is wasting, and there is a huge um, hidden hunger that is micronutrient malnutrition that is there, especially in women and children. We know in several societies and communities, even now, women eat last, women partake their food last, and sometimes by the time they take uh, food, nothing is available, in uh, poor, especially in poorer households. So uh, it compromises their nutrition and their uh, health as well. Looking at some of the figures that have been published by the National uh, Family Health Survey, this is a recent survey, and uh, up to about 25% of women in certain states have low body mass index, which is not uh, a sign that is very healthy. And at the same time, on the other side, we find that the obesity levels among women and the risk levels among women, health risk among women are increasing. And there are similar trends for men as well, where we find that obesity levels are increasing, but the percentage of women, um, men having uh, low body mass index is lesser than that of women, indicating that there are within household, intra household inequalities in food availability. And more alarming are the figures for, of anemia, any, anemia among children and women. We find that among children in certain states, up to 80% of women are, of children are anemic. And women in the age group of 15 to 49 years, we find that up to 70% of women in some states are anemic. So these are figures, the latest of figures that have come in, and these are really alarming. Interestingly, if you look at the anemia position of men, they're much better. This again reinforces the um, fact that there are inequalities in house access to nutrition at household level, because these are figures from the same households. If you look at the other aspect of health that is blood sugar and hypertension these are also mentioned in the reports we find that it is increasing for both men and women and this may be more uh, if you take into consideration uh, the pandemic uh, that is that we all are facing through leading to increased stress levels so if another study is made now probably the stress levels will be higher and these two factors may be higher so we know that there are deficiencies in food intake and uh, across um, Households, we found that women consume less less than men in all categories of food, whether it is vegetables, pulses, milk and milk products, fish and meat, etc. This can also be related to educational and socioeconomic factors. So if you take uh, people with schooling and no schooling or urban and rural or poorer and rich households or communities, vulnerable communities like the scheduled tribes and scheduled castes, we find that uh, the food intake and the nutritional factors are much lower. So what do we do for ensuring nutrition equity? So this again is from the Global Nutrition Report. We have to um, have sustainable food and health systems. This has become more and more, um, what is it, relevant during these times where we, we have come to understand that it is the health of people, the immunity that people have that can really keep such pandemic at bay and um, equip ourselves to actually deal with such pandemics. We need more commitments and accountability from national governments so that uh, these targets are actually achieved. And these challenges are global challenges. They are not challenges that one country can face on its own. So they are global challenges, just like we saw in the COVID situation. Uh, 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 I think that in one country, when it was impacted, all countries got impacted. So these are the challenge of hunger and nutrition is also a global challenge. And so the uh, efforts also must be 
joint efforts. And uh, fundamentally, we must learn to invest in nutrition, especially in vulnerable communities. So translating these into action is actually where the challenge lies. And we can start off with uh, looking at diet quality and cost versus cost. We know that the focus of large-scale government food programs are on energy-sufficient diets. They mostly look at staples, uh, at uh, make, making people uh, available staples. So when we uh, move on to nutri nutrient adequate diets or healthy diets, uh, the expenditure on these are maybe two times or five times more than what is required for energy sufficient diets. And that is one of the reasons why these large scale programs are mostly uh, focused on energy minutes. sufficient diets. And a recent study uh, has shown that 73% of Indians are deficient in protein actually. And uh, there is also a gap in knowledge of the quality of protein that is required in daily diets. And there is a lot of myths that surround these. So there's a lot of aware, a lack of awareness among people on what constitutes a healthy diet actually. So there are ways, uh, definitely there are ways. There's, there's, there's the policy focus on women, children and men on different groups of people. We have the Portion Abhiyan, which uh, is the National Nutrition Mission, which is on addressing stunting, wasting and anemia amongst children and young people. So through the pillars of technology convergence, behavioral change and capacity building, and they're using basically ICDS and National Health Mission for uh, delivering these uh, uh, this program but i think we should also use the uh, a pds system this is actually having a wide coverage it reaches a large number of people and i think this can be one more core delivery platform for the national nutrition mission uh, considering its reach among the people and the focus of pds itself must shift from staples to becoming more broad based with nutrition and not mere food sufficiency being the guiding principle and this is where i think fish can become an important nutritional input. Why fish-based interventions? Already Dr. Rohana and all the other speakers, Velvidi and Dr. Malda spoke about this because it is highly balanced and easily digestible protein. It contains all essential amino acids and more importantly, it contains micronutrients, which is the main reason for, the lack of which is the main reason for hidden hunger, uh, uh, micronutrient malnutrition in the country. And India is very uniquely placed, as we saw from Dr. Imelda's uh, presentation. We have a wide variety of species. We have a wide variety of water resources where we can actually uh, raise our fish. And uh, this needs integrated into fish needs to be integrated into nutrition pro programs very proactively. Looking at uh, the fish consumption, uh, we found that there is a large variation. And actually, about 30-35% of people have never eaten fish. So this is really... Uh, an area where we should have more focus when more awareness creation is required. If this is not, uh, these are not households that are vegetarian, by the way. And there's large variation, understandably, where we have coastal states having uh, more uh, consumption. This is especially women. And in interior states in, hinterland, in the hinterland, where we have very uh, less percentage of people, especially women, having fish. And we had a very successful intervention from ICR, um, for CIFT, that is my institute, where we have we actually used fish powder as a vehicle to deliver iron to anemic adults and girls. This was an ex social experiment that was carried out in West India Hills in Meghalaya, where sodium ion EDTA was used as a fort uh, fortificate for the first time. And here we found that in 60 days, uh, in 123 girls, this was uh, administered. And there was significant increase in hemoglobin levels and decrease in prevalence of anemia. So these are alternatives that can be tried uh, when we actually, you know, uh, go for uh, strategies for integrating fish into our food and nutritional programs. So we can actually target both production and consumption. So we have these homestead-based production systems that the, what Dr. Rohana showed at the end, uh, small fish. We can have these native species with regular cultured species like carp. And these native species, small fish, can become, uh, they can uh, go into family food and nutrition security for, in ensuring family food and nutrition security. So these are fish that uh, the photo which he showed was from Orissa. But they, I think World Fish is doing this experiment in several other countries, and this can be actually uh, propagated more widely. So that is one thing looking at it from the production point of view. And from the product consumption point of view, we need to create better awareness um, in the benefits of consuming fish. And I think we have a National Fisheries Development Board which can take a lead in this, have a national mission for with popularizing efforts. And we can have fish-based supplements like the experiment that I just mentioned uh, in the previous slide, and greater research is, is needed on this. And uh, this actually requires more funding, and this is one area where 
we need to actually pour, pour in funds and we can have fish based supplements which can be introduced into schemes like the mid midday meal schemes so that is the target we have to target the children unless we target the children i think uh, we, we we cannot really have uh, achieve anything uh, towards the end so i will stop here thank you thank you dr nikita for a wonderful presentation uh, uh, addressing various uh, dimensions of uh, uh, nutrition equity and also the important uh, gender differences that's that you have observed in your studies and for the good work that you have done with the uh, nutrition supplements using fish uh, uh, we have had a, a very good presentations and now it's for the uh, uh, Questions. I, I see in the chat box that uh, there's one question addressed to Dr. Beverly and the other two uh, questions uh, other speakers can uh, address. Dr. Beverly? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the first question related to the uh, the impact of the reduction of fishes in near shore areas on small scale fishes. Yes, uh, the reduction. Uh, <clears throat> In near shore fishing affects in many ways for uh, small scale uh, fishermen. Uh, one is about the area, uh, the fishing operational area shifted from uh, uh, 20 kilometers to 100 kilometers. That is the area of operation shifted one side. Then on the other side, the fishing days also increased. Uh, so normally the small scale fishers going for uh, fishing for uh, one or two days. Uh, so nowadays they spend more days uh, um, sea for uh, fishing. Their fishing days. Uh, 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 increased from two to five days to 15 days. Uh, then uh, another important uh, impact is that since they don't have enough uh, storage facility uh, from the boat, uh, which leads to landing of poor, poor quality of uh, fish, which uh, reduction in value, this greatly affected the uh, income of the small scale fishes. So these are some of the impact of uh, uh, the near shore, uh, lack of near shore fishing. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nibili. Uh, regarding that uh, environmental impact of fisheries, both aquaculture and captive fisheries, Dr. Rohana, would you be able to add from your experiences? Uh, thanks, Dr. Punaya. Yes, um, I will try, uh, which we can talk about a, a year about the question that how to reduce the environmental impact of aquaculture and fisheries. We've probably been talking about it for the past four decades. Um, it's extremely difficult to answer in one minute, but I think everything that we do in terms of research, everything that we do to improve sustainability is all continue to reduce the environmental impact. It has been, and we should recognize the fact that for the past 30 years, environmental footprint of both fisheries and aquaculture has gone down tremendously and significantly and the, the environmental impact of aquaculture of fish production compared to any other animal food production is the least and the lowest. So we should be happy about it and we should continue to work towards reducing the impacts, particularly environmental impacts and reducing carbon emission and addressing as uh, Dr. Nikita and also Dr. Imald have said that it is important to recognize the environmental and climate resilience aquaculture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anna. I, I think the next three questions, uh, uh, Dr. Nikita, though you are, may not be expert, at least from your institute, quite a lot of work has been done. So you, you should be able to throw some light on that. Uh, first is the one on uh, whether the profile changes for uh, capture and, uh, and next on post service classes, and then about the palatability and uh, safety of the food. Yes, uh, the profile changes. Uh, actually, it is not capture and aquaculture alone. It is fish to fish, the profile changes. So, uh, but, but the basic like protein, moisture, ash, those things remain same. There is approximate composition. But the uh, content, the percentage of each thing uh, differs from different fish. Definitely it does. It is uh, already there's a lot of work being done on nutrition profiling by CFT and there was a huge network project by CMFRI, I mean CIFRI also. So, those things are well recorded and uh, well studied. So there is difference between nutrition profile between different uh, uh, fish. 
And the next question on losses, actually, this is a very tricky question because um, there is nothing, uh, there is no single uh, post harvest loss uh, calculation. So when we did the study on post harvest losses, it was like right from the catch, from the onboard to the market, uh, we have to study and, and to the consumption level, we have to study. So there is a difference in uh, losses at each stage. That is fundamentally because I think we have still not valued fish as as food. We don't give it the respect it deserves, uh, especially in our country. And that is why we have such high uh, losses. Uh, somewhere around 25% is what is um, accepted uh, technically, but uh, we have huge losses on board sometimes when uh, catches are thrown off when they get you know high value species. So there is difference on that. And that needs to be looked at from different angles and uh, nodes of the supply chain, we have to look at it, uh, of the value chain, we have to look at it. And uh, the one question is uh, breeding season. That I think is uh, um, monsoon and breeding season. I think that is one of the factors that is taken into account when the close seasons were uh, are decided upon. And there is a continuing work, I think, by CMFRA on that. Uh, that work is a continuous work on deciding on uh, the close seasons during the monsoon and the breeding and all that. They, they do a lot of work on that. CMFR does a lot of work on that. And uh, pathogens and bacteria and water during monsoon, I don't think there is any um, correlation between monsoon and the uh, presence of pathogens and bacteria in the water. So uh, I, I don't seem to have come across any studies on that. The, uh, the contamination actually comes uh, post-harvest mostly in how you handle the fish and how you store the fish because it is um, a living organism and once it dies it, the, the uh, decay starts so it's how you handle the fish and uh, store the fish that that's that that's the level at where most of the contamination takes place uh, and as such whether the water uh, contaminates the fish i don't i don't think i i don't think that i have, I have come across any studies on that but uh, definitely if there are areas uh, especially in near shore waters in uh, interior uh, uh, in backwaters, when there is a human interaction with the, the same water bodies used by both humans and the fish, fish lives, I think that there is contamination of uh, pathogens there. So the fish caught from that area, I think probably we could think of. So, so I think. Yeah, you have, you have covered all that. Thank you, Dr. Nikita. Thank you. Sir. Uh, I guess. Uh, uh, Regarding that, uh, especially, I think uh, we should be very careful with uh, saying like uh, uh, there are pathogens and bacteria. This is more of a geographical location, uh, location where it is sometimes uh, due to effluence it is there, but it's not over. It's, it's not, not over all. Yeah. Nothing to yeah. do with monsoons. Uh, For monsoons, it is from a, uh, I mean, uh, management issue of uh, not catching uh, rooders. That's the only thing that we need to be uh, concerned with. I'll add some more to the points that was already raised regarding these questions. Uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, I mean, uh, at least uh, uh, in ICI institutes, a lot of information is there, not, not on the nutrition profile. In fact, uh, there is a publication from SIBA on uh, uh, shrimp as a health food. Now, uh, that, is, that is, somebody will say it's an oxymoron because uh, uh, how can a shrimp be health? But when you really analyze it, uh, shrimp cholesterol does not contribute to blood cholesterol. And there are a lot of things in shrimp which are quite makes it a healthy food uh, that brings it to the other uh, point that i would like to add is that uh, uh, what uh, nikita also pointed out is that we really need uh, to have a like like egg mission uh, we need to increase consumption of fish uh, i mean something which uh, dr rohana also touched upon and which other speakers have touched upon is that the consumption is not growing according to its potential both in terms of uh, from the fisherman perspective or from the uh, nutrition and health perspective. There's a lot of things that could be done with fish, uh, which we are not doing. So consumption has to increase. And for that, I think an awareness campaign is very much essential. Uh, fish, uh, if you look at it, uh, if you are, uh, uh, especially the aquaculture fish, when you feed it with different feeds, it changes the profile. Uh, not much on the, like, the major constitution, but just on the things, especially uh, the research now that's being done for a substitution of uh, uh, fish meal with plant proteins, you definitely see a profile change in the fishes. But uh, currently, research is being targeted at that also. So I, I'm sure that uh, they'll come. Uh, so if there are 
No other questions. I would just leave. Sir, uh, excuse me, sir. I, I have a question. I'm Dr. Harigaran from MS Swaminathan Foundation. Yeah, please, please. Yeah. Sir, thank you very much. It's a wonderful session to hear, and uh, we are able to get the uh, current perspective from different dimensions and so on. See, uh, looking at the uh, overall uh, issue now, fish is a viable option to really alleviate nutrition, uh, malnutrition issues and so on. But when it comes to COVID-19 pandemic and uh, how we can really use fish as one of the, uh, you know, tool to alleviate uh, malnutrition, if you can throw some light on that, it will be wonderful, sir. Because climate change in the larger issue, it, you know, we have some models and we can, but uh, in COVID-19, nutrition security has really become a challenge. And uh, certainly this, this, there may be some options where we can use uh, fish. So request the, uh, you know, panel to. Anybody would like to? Sir, this is Shamdan from Sibha, sir. Sir, I, I would like to uh, give some inputs on that. Uh, because um, uh, COVID-19 actually farm to fish a uh, lot of demand is there. Because many places lockdown and things like that. Because uh, marketing is an issue with fish during uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, for nutrition, as such, uh, fish improves the immunity of the person who consumes it. If we have a very good marketing strategy, definitely uh, it can be given. Uh, it can be given to all uh, people, and uh, it improves uh, because it contains a lot of vitamins and uh, this um, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, which uh, boost the immunity. So people can uh, consume it uh, during with proper uh, cleaning and all that. And if it's available, marketing is paka uh, and availability is there. Uh, it improves the uh, immunity of the people who consume, uh, especially marine fishes. But there was challenges for going uh, fishers going to the sea itself, no, for some time. Yeah, yes, that was during the initial period of the lockdown when uh, there was a total lockdown. But after that, uh, when the first unlocking of the, including agriculture, took place, uh, fishing also was allowed. The with restrictions, that is uh, the. Um, only a few people could go on a particular boat. So there were restrictions on the number of people on a boat, uh, etc. So at that time, fishing was allowed. Uh, and uh, there is one marketing strategy that was um, adopted by the government of Kerala, uh, where the um, harbor management committee was formed with all stakeholders involved, that is fishermen with the Melsifed, which is the uh, federation, uh, government uh, federation of the cooperatives as well as the department and the uh, stakeholders within the harbor and landing centers and they actually fa they they reached a fixed price uh, formula so that whenever the fishermen came back with the fish uh, a particular fish for a sardine or mackerel they got the same price so this unhealthy competition for coming first did not exist during that time so this was started actually it was also to see that the covid protocols were followed in the harbors and landing centers that this a particular pattern of marketing was initiated and all the unsold fish was actually um, procured by Mulsifet, stored and then released into the market later from to their own stalls. They have their own stalls. So that was one marketing strategy that was observed, uh, that was observed during that time. Uh, and as Dr. Imelda mentioned, it was actually um, getting the fish that was available to the people that was a, that was a challenge during the uh, COVID lockdown period. Online marketing caught up a lot during that time but again online marketing has a very clear uh, consumer base you can't reach uh, several people cannot actually access online markets and uh, buy purchase fish like that another um, option i would see especially in rural areas if we can actually go for uh, homestead uh, fish production that is the small indigenous species uh, production that is possible in several states because we have water bodies in almost all in in several states we have small water bodies derelict water bodies that can be actually sourced for uh, production of small indigenous species which we have not actually focused on still now because our focus was on increasing production so we were focused as, in inland we were focusing on the um, uh, calves and uh, fast growing species which is actually income generating employment generating but actually if you want to go for household uh, food uh, and nutrition security I think we should be propagating small indigenous species uh, along with the uh, commercial species so that that can entirely go into household uh, to meet household nutrition. 
otherwise getting fish to people uh, i think the streamlining the marketing is the only way that we can actually solve this issue and the prices had risen tremendously during that period initially during the lockdown uh, there was a fall in demand but then uh, when the demand started to rise uh, prices also went beyond control this, this is something that uh, we faced in kerala especially uh, maybe there there were situations like this in other states as well so there is no one strategy to actually solve this issue we must look at it from several angles thank you madam that uh, you know gave the good answer as well as identified the gap areas so that will be very useful thank you and one one small thing was that women were completely out of the marketing during the covid because they were stuck at home they were they had to face uh, fisher women they had to take care of the families the elders the children in the family so and they were not able to access fish in the market so that is one group of people that was completely out of the marketing during covid and that the group needs to be specifically looked at thank you uh, dr nikita uh, just to add to that in fact with now vaccination uh, uh, if uh, if you are if you are very really sure of vaccination you can have uh, the same vaccinated people on the same uh, uh, fishing vessel but uh, one problem really here at least you see in tamil nadu is the fish landing center because of uh, fish landing centers can be super spreader places so that needs to be managed if that's managed because uh, the during the covid time you also saw a good potential shrimp which was not reaching every house or was being supplied to every house now uh, many people who are not familiar with shrimp became familiar during pandemic uh, about shrimp so i think that uh, advantage we should take care of there is one more question uh, about prawn is a highly valued question but a few people are allergic to prawn eating uh, yes uh, it is true uh, just like uh, peanut peanut also i mean like the groundnut that you see it's also allergic so there are certain proteins that people are allergic uh, only thing is that uh, i mean people should be sensitized about it so that immediately they can take uh, if there is a, nothing that uh, uh, you can uh, do about uh, people who are uh, allergic but then it's a very minority and they are, and that minority is it's uh, i read it it is lower than what is there for peanut and other proteins so it is not uh, that much but yes there is a uh, 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 problem for uh, allergy is there in uh, shrimp any more questions okay uh, if no more questions uh, like i said i just for me uh, two messages i would like to the consider is that uh, uh, i think there should be more uh, work done on aquaculture uh, systems uh, perspective because uh, that will address many of the uh, problems and even some when you talk about environmental impact if you talk in a system perspective it is the energy which is uh, the major uh, thing uh, what we do for aquaculture energy and feed are the major ones that is really having a climate change impact so if you look at it from a system perspective uh, that should be avoided and the last one as i said is that we really need to clear the myths about uh, fish and also the benefits of fish so uh, really a campaign will greatly help this Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. We can close. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you for all thank the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Our thank next you. session will be at three three thirty p.m. Uh, please assemble. that session 4 uh, food and nutrition security in, in the covid uh, context recording stopped